Well, joining me now via phone call, because he would prefer not to be seen on camera, is Jeffrey Epstein's brother, Mark Epstein. Uh, Mark Epstein, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Um, let me first of all ask you, what did you know about your brother? I mean, it's an obvious question, but you are his relative, his sibling. Um, when this all came out about him, were you as shocked as everybody else, or did you have concerns about him? Well, just back in 2006, when he first got into trouble, he told me that he was getting into trouble, you know, for uh, what he was doing. And uh, so, so I knew from early on what was happening. I, uh, yeah, so I, he told me early on. Did you know the scale of it? I mean, obviously, he had that conviction. He served time in, in prison. But the sheer scale yeah, I, of what I, I has made, emerged I made it since... Real clear. I made it real clear. I'm not discussing anything about my brother and his charges against him. I have nothing to do with that. I wasn't involved. I have no mm. more information. The only thing I'm interested in discussing is the circumstances surrounding his murder. OK, well, you say it's a murder. Obviously, it was ruled as suicide. Why do you believe that's not true? Well, first, the, the actual pathologist who did the autopsy uh, did not determine it was a suicide. They couldn't. They said it looked more like a homicide. But on the, death, on the initial death certificate, on the cause of death, it said pending, meaning pending further investigation, which is proper. And then a few days later, you know, Bill Barr claims it was a suicide. And then the chief pathologist of New York, who did not see the body, claims it's a suicide. So the point, the question becomes, what investigating was done in a matter of days to make them come out with that determination? And it turns out that because it was called a suicide, there doesn't seem to have been an investigation. Because if you declare somebody died by suicide, there's really nothing to investigate. You know, the only questions about a suicide is how did they do it? Did they hang themselves? Did they shoot themselves? Did they jump out of a window? And that's a pretty obvious answer at the time of the death. So there's no investigation was done. The EMTs that went to the prison were never questioned. The hospital personnel were never questioned. We can't seem to find the medical records. We can't get the 911 call. If this was a suicide, why are all these things hidden? And why did I mean, Bill obviously, make that ridiculous statement? Right. Let's talk about the night that your brother died. He was found hanged. What is it about Supposedly, what happened yeah. that night? The, the, well, yeah, well, OK, he, that's what was reported. So tell me why you think that what happened that night is so suspicious. OK, first of all, for four years, we were trying to find out what position his body was in when he was found. Because that, that's very telling. Uh, but we couldn't find out because they moved his body after he was found uh, to the infirmary of the prison. When the EMTs were called and they got to the prison, he was already dead in the infirmary. Understand something. He had been dead for at least two hours before he was found. That's what the autopsy showed. And that's not a question. That's a fact. He could have been dead for six hours, but at least two. Now, they said in the DOJ report that finally came out, that he was found hanging. They said he was in a seated position with his legs extended in front of him. And when he was and he tied to the top bunk, and when they either cut him or tore him down, his buttocks was an inch and an inch and a half off the ground, which if you picture that, it means basically his entire body weight or the bulk of his body weight was hanging by the neck. Yes, there was probably some weight on his feet at the end of his legs, but the bulk of his body was hanging. So the mark on his neck left by the ligature is in the middle of his neck and goes straight back. If he was hanging, as they said, the ligature would have you know, slid up high up under his chin and then went up back sort of behind his ears up to the, whatever he was tied to. So the ligature mark on his neck is inconsistent with the way they describe them. And another important thing is that when you die, when a person dies, you know, their blood isn't circulating anymore. And what happens, the blood starts to settle in the body to the lowest point. Gravity just takes the blood you know, through the tissue. So you get a pooling of the blood under the skin, which, which is why they tell you to never move a dead body, because they can tell 
a lot of things. If you find a dead body laying on its face and the back has this lividity, this pool of blood, that means the body died on its back and somebody eventually turned it over. So if you picture the way they describe Jeffrey as hanging, well, he should have lividity in, in the back of his legs and in his buttocks, which was the lowest part of his body. Okay, if he, it, let me ask you this. If he didn't take his own life, who yes. do you think took it? Who killed him, in your oh, it's, estimation? It's a, it's a good question. You know, Bill Barr said that no one went in there out of the tier, so he concluded it was a suicide. But there were something like 11 or 12 other prisoners on that tier that could have went in and killed him. Now, if another prisoner killed him, it's sort of why would they go to the extent to cover it up? You know, it's like if, if you remember the case of Whitey Bulger, he was in prison and he got killed by three other inmates. Well, they got the guys and they prosecuted him for killing Whitey Bulger in jail. If it was just another prisoner that killed Jeff, why would they not just find out who it was and prosecute him for murder? It, it, there doesn't seem to be a reason to cover that up. Also, we can't get a list of who were those prisoners that were already on the tier. We know, I know one was uh, Cataglione, who was Jeff's you know, cellmate for a while. Now, the question becomes, who was on the tier that night? When were they put there? And when were they transferred out? Because I was told that after the death, a number of prisoners were transferred off of that tier to other places. So if Let me ask you, Mark Epstein, let me ask you, do you, do you believe, obviously, Jeffrey, your brother, had yep. uh, relationships, friendships with many, many of the most rich, famous, powerful people in the world. Do you believe yep. that... You know, if it's, let's take this, this theory to uh, a conclusion here. Do you think that one of those people who may have had a vested interest in shutting him up and not talking about what he knew about them potentially may have played a part in his death? Yes, that's what I think happened. And then you have to question, out of the rich and powerful people he knew, who would have the ability to pull something like this off? That's another question. Who would have the ability to plant somebody in there if that's the way it was done? Who would have the ability for the, to have the Justice Department come up with this, you know, pardon the language, this bullshit report? You know, in the Justice Department report, it just says that it was declared dead by the uh, pathologist. But that's not true. It was, it was declared undetermined by the pathologist that did the actual report. And then okay. for some you, reason... You, you've claimed... Yeah, you, you've claimed, uh, Mark Epstein, that your brother had information on Donald Trump and Bill Clinton that was so incendiary that the 2016 election would have been cancelled if that information had come out. <laughs> no, what, what was that information? No, that, that, wait, wait, yes, that's incorrect. What Jeffrey told me okay. during the 2016 election, we were just discussing the election, just two brothers talking about current things. Uh, he, what he said was that if he said what he knew about both candidates, they'd have to cancel the election. So he was talking about Donald Trump and he was talking about Hillary. But Don, Bill wasn't running at that point in time. And, and, and Jeffrey used to sometimes tell me things about people he was with, whatever. I never heard Jeffrey say anything bad about Bill Clinton. Jeffrey always liked Bill Clinton. And he, he admired Bill Clinton. So I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, yeah, he, he didn't say he had information on Bill Clinton. He mentioned the candidate, so I want to keep the record straight. I like to keep facts out there, not speculation. What information? What information do you think he had on Donald Trump, for example, that could have uh, disqualified well, him from that election? I don't know any specific information. I don't know any specific information, but I've also heard Jeffrey say that he stopped hanging out with Donald Trump when he realized Trump was a crook. That's on tape. I, I heard a videotape interview with Jeff, and he said that he stopped hanging out with Donald Trump when he realized Trump was a crook. Do you believe that there are? Do, do you believe? Do you, do you believe that there are these videotapes, which came out of the, no in the unsealed documents yesterday, that there are videotapes uh, which apparently were from cameras that your brother put in place, recording famous people from Prince Andrew to Bill Clinton to Richard Branson and others uh, having sex on tape? Do you believe that? You know, I, I've heard those stories, and it's sort of like doesn't matter if I believe it or not. I don't know. So, again, I, I shy away from speculating on things I have no facts on, okay? I, I was told by somebody who supposedly knew that there were not cameras 
in the New York house. You know, I know there were cameras around the entryways and for security. I was told there was no cameras inside. But again, I, I don't know if that's how reliable that I thought it was reliable. You know, and I don't have any reason to, to doubt it. But again, I don't want to speculate. So, so I have no knowledge of any tapes or anything. Yeah. OK, Mark Epstein, I appreciate you joining me. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Well, I'm joined now by Gloria Allred, who represents uh, over 20 of Jeffrey Epstein's victims. Gloria, uh, what did you make of that conversation with Mark Epstein? Well, I like the fact that he was fact based. I do think there is quite a bit of uh, rumor, conspiracy theory, uh, filling the vacuum of, you know, the facts that didn't come out as soon as they might have. Uh, so I still think that there are a lot of questions about whether it was a suicide, whether it was a homicide, uh, whether it was some kind of natural death. I, I don't know. It, it, I know there have been, you know, a report, I believe, by the, uh, you know, many investigations which decided or concluded that it was a suicide. But I think there's still an open question. I remember seeing Jeffrey Epstein the last time he appeared in court in New York. And I know that many of the victims that I represented, 20 that I represent, many of those 20 were hoping and expecting that there would be uh, other hearings, other, you know, in the prosecution that was taking place of him. And they were so thrilled that finally, there might be some justice in the case in the criminal justice system. Of course, uh, his death uh, ended in in a way that was uh, and at a time that was so unexpected and was devastating to many of the victims who hoped to be able to confront him in that court of law in federal court in New York. What people who don't know Jeffrey Epstein just know all these uh rumor mill stuff and some of it's true some of it isn't you know it's hard to really piece together the reality here about him what is your belief about jeffrey epstein gloria well definitely i called him i call him a child sex abuser uh a sex trafficker of underage girls and uh that's what uh, of course uh Ghislaine maxwell was charged with and was convicted in federal court uh, I, by the way, I never use the word pedophile because that means a lover of children. And a man who exploits and hurts and traffics uh, and, uh, you know, does what he did to underage girls and to often to adult women as well, is not a lover of children, is not a lover of women. He's a manipulator uh, and uh, he's a... a a sex predator. There's a lot of ongoing speculation about Prince Andrew's uh, friendship with Epstein and what he knew or didn't know. Uh, the bottom line is he paid Virginia Giuffray uh, a reported $11 million to settle a case with her that he said he was never going to settle. Uh, what, what do you read into that? I mean, is there any way in a normal world that somebody would pay someone that amount of money to stop a case proceeding? if they didn't have something to hide. I've done countless uh, settlements after litigation or what we call pre-litigation, and the accused person never uh, admits that he did it. But when we do it, uh, you know, we present a great deal of evidence to the accused through his lawyers. And, uh, and then there is a process, often a mediation process with a retired judge or a professional mediator, where there's conversation, which is really a negotiation, and there's a result. So bottom line, I can't say whether he did it or not, but it certainly raises the question if he paid substantial uh, millions of dollars to resolve and settle the case. Gloria Royd, as always, great to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, on Sense of Next, I'll be getting more on this story with my panel, including Epstein's former lawyer, Alan Dershowitz.
Welcome back to Uncensored from Los Angeles. Let's get more now on the bombshell court documents about pedophile Jeffrey Epstein's powerful friends. Joining me now is his former lawyer and the author Alan Dershowitz, the investigative journalist Vicky Ward and Fox News host Tommy Lahren. Well, welcome to all of you. Alan Dershowitz, let me start with you. You've obviously, your name has, has appeared in these unsealed documents in various places. Um, what should we read into these documents? There's so much claim, counterclaim, denial, suspicious silence in some cases. What should the public make of it? Well, first, I want every document to come out, every single one. I want every videotape to be revealed. I hope there are videotapes of every single sexual encounter that anybody ever had in any property of Jeffrey Epstein, and I hereby waive any right of privacy, because I know I did nothing wrong. I had sex with one woman from the day I met Jeffrey Epstein till the day he died, my wife. And these tapes have revealed exculpatory material. Sharon Churcher, for example, there were emails that show that she put my name into the head of Virginia Gouffre. She said, although we know Dershowitz didn't do anything wrong, he didn't, we didn't, we couldn't prove anything against him. Uh, uh, it would be a good name for you to put in your book because he's famous. He represented Klaus von Bülow. A movie was made about him. And then she put me in her book as somebody she did not have sex with. So, you know, these disclosed materials have helped people who were falsely accused by me. They don't help people who have been truthfully accused. There's another woman named Sarah Ransom who also now uh, it's been disclosed that she claimed to have sex tapes of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and now she's admitted that she made the whole thing up. So it's a very good thing that these tapes and these pictures and these emails have come out. I want more to come out. There are FBI reports. I've seen an FBI report, but it's redacted. There are tape recordings that are relevant to the innocence or guilt of people who are accused. The one thing we shouldn't do is engage in McCarthyism. We shouldn't do what McCarthy did. He held up lists and said, if your name is on the list, you're guilty. My name is on the list. Of course it is. I was his lawyer. But my name is on the list in an exculpatory way. And so I'm very pleased that these materials have come out. I want more to come out. We filed a brief the other day in court demanding even more information to come out because all the information will prove that I did nothing wrong. I was his lawyer. If you don't like that, well, then complain about our legal system. But I never had any improper relation with anybody connected okay. to Jeffrey Epstein or anyone else. You mentioned Sarah Ransom there. She uh, is one of Epstein's victims. And she made the claims about the existence of these sex tapes. Then she did retract That's them. Right. But interestingly, she's now come out and doubled down on her original claim in an interview with my old show, Good Morning Britain. Let's take a look. They are videos that exist. The people that know they exist, um, I'm sure, are very frightened of them being released. So how do you know, then, that Epstein had cameras on the island? It's no secret that everything was recorded. Multiple victims have come forward confirming my account along with others. I've also seen recordings in his office. Well, Vicky Ward, you, you actually met uh, Sarah Ransom. Uh, it's hard to know where the truth lies, given that she has said one set of uh, claims, then she's retracted them, and now she's doubled down on the original claims. What do you think? Well, I think if you listen to her language, just there, Piers, she's not quite doubling down on the specifics of the original claims. She's just saying there are tapes. She's not saying specifically of who. I think, look, Sarah Ransom in 2022 published a memoir called Silence No More, which you know will have had to have gone through pretty rigorous legal vetting and fact checking. And none of the specific allegations that we read uh, in the document done yesterday are in there. And Sarah Ransom was not uh, a witness or a, an accuser taking the stand in Ghislaine Maxwell's criminal trial, nor was Virginia Roberts. Nonetheless, the pattern of behavior that both of them described did form the backbone of the substance being discussed at that trial. And I think that is why it's important for other victims were the, were the victims who took the stand in Ghislaine Maxwell's trial. They also, by the way, 
got things wrong. When they were first interviewed by the FBI, uh, they then either forgot it or, 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 or had to sort of say they misremembered it when, when under cross-examination. It happens with stories of extreme sexual abuse. It does, all of this does make it really hard for journalists like us to sort out the wheat from the chaff. And this story, you know, the whole the Je Jeffrey Epstein story still remains a huge mystery because, you know, in these latest filings, we get this lurid picture into endless depravity. The man seems to have had so much sexual activity a day, it leaves you wondering when he had time to do anything else. And if he didn't have time to do anything else, then why were all these really important, powerful world leaders floating around him? There are lots of uh, questions here that are still outstanding. Yeah, I mean, Tommy Lahren, looking at this in totality, you've got a guy that was clearly a serial abuser, often of underage girls, doing it in plain sight whilst also maintaining a position as financier and socialite friend of the most rich, powerful, famous people on earth. And yet the only person so far who's been brought to justice over any of this is his former fixer, Ghislaine Maxwell. Not a single man has been brought to account here, despite the welter of evidence that they're all there at the time, a lot of these people. What do you think of it? Well, I'll tell you this, money is power, and we know from looking at Hollywood, especially over the last 10 years, and we've had more revelations thanks to the Me Too movement, which is very selective, by the way, that pedophiles and predators protect one another because Hollywood and places of power, D.C. included, are crawling with predators and pedophiles. That's why it's taken so long for us to get this information. That's why so many have protected not only Epstein, but have protected the logs that have protected these document dumps from coming out. We get redacted versions. We get sensationalism with names being thrown around. But will we ever really get to the bottom of it? Will we ever really get to the bottom of what happened to Jeffrey Epstein? A lot of us are not confident we ever will because we understand what I said. Predators and pedophiles protect one another. And the fact that Hollywood and the elites have been coddling this man and this information for so long tells you everything that you need to know about the inner workings, the dungeons that make up Hollywood, D.C., and political elites around the world. They protect each other. Alan, do you yeah. believe that Jeffrey Epstein killed himself, or do you believe, as his brother said earlier, that he was murdered? Well, I don't know for sure. I think he had a motive to kill himself. He couldn't stand the idea of spending the rest of his life in prison. But the circumstances demand investigation. I don't believe if he committed suicide, he did it by himself. He would have had to pay off, I think, some of the guards. I think some of the guards have been disciplined. Everybody who has any culpability should be held responsible. I'm on the same side as the victims in this case. I want all the evidence to come out so that the true victims are vindicated. But I also want the evidence to come out that shows that there are some credibility questions about people like Ransom and others. You have said that Prince Andrew shouldn't have settled with Virginia Dufre That's and right. Nay Roberts, obviously. Uh, why do you believe that? Well, even if everything they said about him was true, she was over the age of consent. Um, she bragged to people about how wonderful it was and to pay millions of dollars for that, uh, a jury would never have come back that way. And I think he could have won the case on legal grounds. But I suspect that he was concerned about what would happen during a deposition, not about necessarily the person who accused him, but about his whole life, because depositions are wide open. I think it was a terrible mistake for Prince Andrew to have uh, settled the case. I wish he could reopen it, because I don't think there was jurisdiction in the federal court. I don't think that there was uh, the statute of limitations was satisfied. There are all kinds of legal issues that he could have won on, but I suspect his mother did not want the embarrassment that would have come out had he sat for a deposition. OK, Vicky, um, you've worked extensively for Vanity Fair. One of the emails that came out was between Virginia Dufre and Sharon Churchill, uh, suggesting that Bill Clinton had stormed into the Vanity Fair offices and threatened them not to write a sex trafficking expose of Epstein. Do you have any knowledge of that? Do we know if that actually happened? Did Clinton do that? I've never heard that. And I know that Graydon Carter, who was the editor at the time, has categorically denied it. 
you know, what did happen and, and what I think sort of probably made its way in a convoluted, ultimately inaccurate form to Virginia uh, many years later writing that email was that Jeffrey Epstein appeared in the Vanity Fair offices um, and uh, had a conversation, the contents of which I've, I've never learned, but it was while my article on him was being fact-checked and supposed to be closing. And all I know, remember I was on bed rest, uh, pregnant with my twins at the time, I was not in the office, was that at the 11th hour, the allegations of Maria and Annie Farmer were cut from the article. Um, so I think that somehow Virginia learned a version of what had happened that was, that was wrong. Tommy, finally, look at the politics of this. Normally you'd say one side could latch onto it, the other side could latch onto it. It's the problem here is you've got prominent figures on both sides. You've got Republican icons like Donald Trump, you've got Democrat icons like the Clintons and so on. Is this a kind of situation where actually a stain on all their houses, no one can really get political gain from this scandal? Yeah, well, I think, I think that right. you know this as well as I do, Piers, that if Donald Trump were implicated in anything illegal or anything nefarious, that would be the first thing that would be explored to the 20th degree because Donald Trump can't breathe without them indicting him. So I think actually Donald Trump's being, name being mentioned, but nothing really beyond a mention, I think that goes to show that Donald Trump is probably very innocent of doing anything nefarious or anything awful, because if he had, that would be, you know, another stain on him in the media runs to do that at every opportunity. If they could, I think we both know they absolutely would. Tommy Lahren, Alan Dershowitz, Vicky Ward, thank you all very much indeed. This scandal will run and run. And we you. may never actually get to the truth, sadly, but I appreciate you joining me.